Chapter 1. Align Your Priorities for Creative Output Life is full of demands. Life is full of obligations. Life is full of temptations. Life is often too full of things that each of us wishes to do, and the time during the day is too short to get it all done. The speed of modern life doesn't help, and it's all too easy to find oneself caught up in the cacophony of urban activity and feel completely drained, emotionally and mentally, every day before you can put a minute into your art. This is the reality of limited time and unlimited wants. When it comes to figuring out how all of it goes together, I have found that priorities are essential, not just to determine a schedule for yourself, but also to make sure what you are doing in your life is what you actually want to be doing. To that end, before you can decide anything, you have to decide what your priorities actually are, rather than what you wish for them to be. This is a matter of self-knowledge, not of willpower. It is coming to grips with who you are, not doing algebra with your time. That comes later. It is not useful to do the thought experiment. What would I do all day if I didn't have to worry about money? The result for most artists is the same. I'd make art. However, it's not that simple. Art is almost never created for its own sake, and even when it is, it's still hard, hard work. Everything you do in life asks something from you. There is no pure, easy joy that doesn't have some amount of investment attached to it. Family is a joyful experience, but comes at a cost to your time, energy, focus, and bank account. Bodybuilding occurs only through subjecting yourself to pain, literally. Having money to spend is quite nice, but that comes only after you have done the work to acquire it, which can require not only long hours, but years of thankless, unprofitable effort. And yes, creative productivity is hard, hard work, with the satisfaction of completion coming only after you have done the work to achieve it, just as it is with money. Yes, money is not everything, and you may do a job for reasons besides money, but you should avoid the tempting fantasy of a job being both maximally profitable and maximally enjoyable in the moment. You aren't going to love every moment in any business. Accept that and go into any endeavor with your eyes open. Obligations and Focus When it comes to ordering your priorities for creative output, or even just life in general, I find it helpful to consider what things are obligatory or unavoidable if you want to maintain your health, sanity, happiness, and integrity, and what things are more optional or good to have when it is convenient. The obligatory things will change in priority according to where you are in life. For most people, they break down broadly into 1. Money 2. Family 3. Health 4. Creativity and purposeful activities 5. Leisure and hobbies 6. Social time 7. Life slash household maintenance. You can't really avoid any of these totally. You must have money to live, at least in the modern environment. You have no option but to take out the trash at some point. Sooner or later, ignoring your health will catch up to you and you will end up sick or disabled. These things are also interrelated. Failing health will impact your leisure time and will also impact your ability to gain money. However, just because these focus areas are obligatory does not mean you can do all of them at maximum capacity. I'm writing this on a laptop at my kitchen table, which is covered with mail I haven't thrown away and condiments I never put back up. While my nine-month-old daughter sleeps and my son plays his allotted time of games for the day, I admit I am not optimizing my household maintenance. My house is messier than others, but I also write books and put out lots of videos. I sacrifice being excellent at my home upkeep in order to work. Likewise, my wife would rather spend time with me or my children than clean, even if she likes the house cleaner than I do. We still clean the house, just not as much or perhaps as thoroughly as other couples might. I also spend less time at the gym compared to when I was single, opting to run for 30 to 40 minutes a night most nights to save time, and going to the gym when I can get my children into bed early. My truck is also quite dusty. I don't wash it except during summer, and not because of water shortages. This is the self-knowledge part for my wife and me. For both of us, our family is the number one priority. Everything else comes after meeting that obligation. Family is where our focus is, and we are happy to sacrifice a messy house, a little income potential, I stay home during the day and my wife only works four days a week, and some social time in order to give the family the attention it needs. I sacrifice those things as well so I can have the time I need to write and produce video content. We meet some obligations minimally so that we can meet others maximally. As the focus intensifies, other things become blurry. Less important things become less visible. Having a dusty car only registers because I'm writing about things I tend to ignore. 
Those who attempt to be great at everything are probably just mediocre at everything, and that's the unfortunate truth. What really matters to you? Is there something on that focus and obligations list that wasn't even on your radar? What feels more like a chore than a focus? These are questions you must ask yourself before you begin budgeting your time and trying to make a schedule of your activities. In my experience, most distress comes not from being unable to order priorities for effectiveness and efficiency, but from attempting to order priorities in a way that goes strongly against your true personality and your mental and emotional needs. You can force yourself to do something that you dislike for a short period of time, but I don't think it's realistic to try to force things that you naturally dislike into becoming natural priorities. If you hate doing dishes, chances are you will always hate it, even if you are very diligent about performing the chore. And if you don't care about an empty sink, having one frequently will not instill that care into you. You have to know who you are. Are you a person that can't stay away from the gym for more than a day? Are you a person who loves working toward the next triathlon? Great, that means fitness and health are a top priority. Sacrificing your gym time to do something else will probably distress you. You need to accept that creativity is a lower concern and enjoy it for what it is. You must put creativity where it truly belongs in your life and schedule. On the flip side, if you're somebody who hates physical exercise, forcing that to be a top priority will probably cause you distress even if you achieve the body you were looking for. More than that, you'll probably be upset at your lack of progress, as other things distract you and keep you away from your unrealistic fitness goals. That doesn't mean you should ignore fitness. It just means you need to be realistic about what kind of time you are truly willing to devote to it, and what time you really can devote to it and still meet your primary obligations. Making time. You cannot complain that your day is missing something that is important to you if you do not specifically make time for that thing. I'll reinforce this to a greater degree in Chapter 2, but having a consistent work schedule is critical to project completion. Working in a haphazard fashion, perhaps only when you have free time, will not only slow you down, it will make the fleeting time you do devote to your passion less efficient. So the first step to being a prolific creator is having time to create. How much time you have to create, and when during your day you are going to do your creative work, are things you are going to have to decide for yourself after you have figured out where your creativity is relative to the other obligations in your life. What is important when making this decision is treating creative work as true work, as an obligation. You should view your work as something you must do, ideally every single day before your day is complete. Just as an example, consider this schedule. 6.30 a.m. Wake up, get coffee, etc. 7.30 a.m. Leave for work. 8 a.m arrive at work, 5 p.m., leave work, 5.30 p.m., gym time, 6.30 p.m., head home, 7 p.m., arrive home, have dinner, 8 p.m., watch TV, 9 p.m., get the kids to bed, 10 p.m., go to bed. This schedule is very simple and missing lots of things, but it represents a typical sort of day for most people. They might have extra things in there, like taking the children to soccer practice, but it's very standard. A person with this schedule might conclude that they should do creative work on the weekends, or cut out TV time and make that hour a creative block. It's a good start, but you will probably need some leisure time if you don't want to go crazy. When I had a schedule like this, when I taught full time, I spent more than three hours per day being creative, and I was more productive than an average person in those three hours. I'll give some strategies to that effect later on, in chapter two, but it all comes down to priorities. Now. Let's take a look at those seven obligations and see how they relate to our primary goal, being creative. One, money. Personal finances, for most people, are something that can only be ignored at perilous risk. We live in a world where we cannot provide for all of our needs, so we must earn money to pay for most of what we consume. Even a stay-at-home parent must carefully manage a budget to ensure the needs of the family are met, even if the duty of earning the income is assigned to the other parent. Money, however, is not something that has to be the primary focus for all people. Those who really focus on making money, investing, or creating businesses can tell you just how much hard work goes into getting rich. A lot has to be sidelined if you are going to be spending 12 hours per day building up your business for a secure tomorrow. It's not just the time spent at the job, but also the mental focus. Make no mistake, business is its own creative endeavor and will occupy headspace, for lack of a better term. My wife often remarks how she knows I'm disconnected from the moment, thinking of something related to my businesses, new book ideas, 
new video ideas, something with marketing, etc. My biggest periods of dissonance actually come not from being out of the moment, but from having these out-of-time moments be occupied by work thoughts, which I didn't actually care about, like when my day job was a public school teacher and I had a million problems to solve every week. Teaching took up a great amount of headspace. I wanted free for other things. If working 60 hours a week at a job or business isn't for you, you aren't alone, which is why most people pick a job that gives maximum payout for minimum work, rather than pursuing the bottom line with relentless fervor. There's nothing wrong with going to work for 8 hours, or less, clocking out and then going home. There's nothing wrong with having a roomy budget that doesn't put the maximum amount into savings every month. All this just means that finances aren't your area of personal excellence and aren't a huge priority. That also means your time and, more importantly, your mental energy is freed up for other pursuits. Let me also say that many, many people in the creative fields I interact with, primarily writing, music, and visual arts, have early illusions that they can combine the obligations of money with their creative output. In effect, they can make a great living while doing what they love. This is a myth, unfortunately, but not because it isn't possible to make money as a creative professional, but rather because any business venture will ask you to do things that you don't readily enjoy. Authors must also be marketers. Musicians must also be booking agents and producers. It won't be pure joyful work when you are actually doing it for a living. In addition, most people new to their field believe that they will be immediately successful and be able to quit their day job right away. The truth is that most immediate success is a fluke. If you actually want to find success, it will take a lot of investment of time, if not money, before you start to see returns. Most businesses lose money early on, and your creative business will probably not be an exception. This brings me back to money. Having enough is important, but you need to leave room in your schedule and your head if you want to make creative gains as well. Consider how much time you really want to work before getting to your real work, creating art. You should consider this before taking a job. The bottom line might be nice, but does it leave room for your creative work in both your schedule and your head? Going back to that example schedule, what if you left work at 3 p.m.? What if you only worked four days per week? How much more room would you have in your life to pack your day with what really matters? Consider this when deciding how to arrange your life. 2. Family One of the most prolific composers of the Baroque period, Johann Sebastian Bach, had a total of 24 children across two marriages while being the music director at five churches at once. He usually wrote a new cantata, a fairly large and complex composition, every week. I bring this up because our society is full of messages that a fulfilling career and family are at odds with one another when they aren't. I've known musicians who tour extensively all over the world and who still have families. Active military personnel who are often deployed for long stretches of time still have families. If your own family is something you really want in your life, you can have it, and you can still have a creative career. But like with anything, understanding focus priorities is key. Family is, by necessity, a lower priority for those who have to spend large amounts of time away from family, such as touring musicians or men engaged in active military service. This doesn't mean that they care less about their family, since what they're doing is often done specifically to provide for a family. I'm merely saying that in terms of time and focus, Family is lower on the list than professional obligations. The same goes for businessmen who spend long hours working or traveling. People are often dishonest with themselves when it comes to preferences, though, and if you aren't a homebody, you shouldn't feel bad about wanting to pour more of your time into your creative projects or your work. Ideally, if you are married and having children, you have a partner with a complementary set of preferences that prefers more time with the kids, or is at least willing to give you time to be creative. When it comes to family, negotiating the balance between obligations is more complicated because you aren't the only party. If you are somebody who doesn't prefer to have his or her own family, family itself is probably still somewhere on the obligation list, even if it is just siblings and parents over the holidays. Family, to me anyway, also includes your primary romantic relationship, as that has the trajectory to become a family even if you don't have children. Just like any life area you develop, time with your romantic partner is a kind of investment. The return is a strong relationship that can sustain periods of separation that are both brief, like gigging on Saturday nights, and prolonged, like going on tour. If you want to make progress on your goals, you need to be spending time on them. Labels like mom and dad need not be your entire identity. In fact, 
I think it is good for my children to see and understand the work their parents do, as this helps them to understand just who their parents are. For me, most of my time is spent on family. Most of my work happens in the margins, but that is how I prefer it. My children are, as I am writing this, still very young and dependent. I will only have that time with them once. I cannot go back in time if I miss portions of their young childhood. When they get older, I know their need for me will diminish, and they will become more independent, so my priorities can and probably will change in a few years' time. It's a bit hard for me to step away from my kids to work while they are awake, but sometimes I need to do that to meet my creative and business goals. 3. Health and Fitness Health, like finance, needs to be a priority on some level for every single person. Ignoring your health will have a massively negative impact on you and your creative output. First, you will be unable to do your work with maximum efficiency and effectiveness. If you are tired from lack of sleep, your focus will be shot, and you won't be able to write. If you ignore a problem like diabetes, you won't be able to function mentally, and you may lose time to being physically ill. Likewise, if your weight is out of control, you will lack the physical capacity to perform live as a musician. Second, ignoring your health will shorten your life. That smoking habit will take its toll eventually. Obesity will catch up with you at some point, and you'll have heart problems that can't be easily fixed by the medical establishment. You'll also go from health that allows you to work to being disabled earlier in your life. All of that will shrink the amount of creative work you can do over the long term. On the other hand, you can sacrifice your health to increase your output in the short term. Artists of varying kinds have taken amphetamines and other stimulants to avoid sleep and work relentlessly, but such a lifestyle comes at a large cost, especially as time goes on. For some people, fitness and health is their absolute top priority, and that's fine if that is you. Exercise will help you live longer and enjoy the life you have to a greater extent, but there's always a cost, usually in the form of time. But it could also be a risk of injury and wear and tear on your body. The main thing is, to keep your creative output consistent, you need to pay attention to your health in some capacity. Working optimally for an hour because you are well rested is probably better than working two hours while fighting sleep or being sick. Not all time spent is equally productive, something I hope I will continue to convince you of throughout this book. I'll address this later, but lots of people give themselves too much slack when they have a cold. If you are truly ill, for me that means throwing up or in horrific pain, it is fine to rest, but having a cold doesn't mean you should be totally out of commission, especially when you have a deadline to meet. Getting that little bit of work done at what capacity you have will be important over the long term. 4. Creativity and Purposeful Activities Here is where we get to producing art. A creative endeavor is something you do because you have a need to create something, to put something out into the world. Painting, music, writing, or even something like winemaking are realms of passion, not merely realms of economic activity. Creativity is always something more than a job. Purposeful activities are fundamentally different from creative endeavors, though they fulfill some of the same psychic needs. These are things like charity or volunteer work, which are intended to make a difference in the lives of others, but aren't done because there is an internal need for those things to exist on their own. Likewise, though they may provide economic benefit, they are not something that is done for the purposes of income. Art is you facing the world. Charity is you loving the world. If you are reading this, passions are probably already a high priority, or you at least desire for them to be a higher priority. Lots, if not most, artists wish they had more time to work. If this is you, what you must first recognize is that creativity is an obligation, not just an activity to fit into the margins, or something to be done only when you feel like it. Just like how you exercise regularly to stay physically healthy, you must also exercise your creative mind to stay spiritually healthy. Putting creativity in the same place as everything else will ensure it becomes a permanent and habitual part of your life. Additionally, if you want to understand the real secret to being prolific, it is consistent work. Doing it daily has always been the best course for every student I have had, and I can usually tell when they have stuck to a practice schedule, speaking mostly of music here. Within a very short time, their growth skyrockets. Over time, the leaps are gargantuan. Or if they haven't stuck to it, we have the same lesson several weeks in a row. I exercise every day. I also write every day. There are a few exceptions, but these are reasonable, like extreme ill health or travel. Just writing 1,000 words per day will potentially yield three, or even four, full-length novels per year. Impressive! 
If you can't do something creative every day, and there may be good reasons for this, if you have odd work shifts or longer than normal days a few times a week, try to at least be consistent week to week. I record most of my YouTube videos on Saturday, and I always have a live stream on Wednesday. That lets me keep my daily work focused on my writing, or if I'm in that place, my music. A note on subcategories. Just like how you can't be great at every large area of priority in your life, you can't be good at all the things which fit into each category. I'm a writer, video content maker, and musician. I can't be equally good at all of those, so I prioritize writing and other things are forced more into the margins. Some seasons I switch that and focus entirely on music or on producing content. Generally, the more focused you are on one thing, the more efficient you become with your work time. 5. Leisure and Hobbies I think for most people who are imagining themselves as productive machines, their idealized self isn't actively engaging in lots of leisure. Again though, self-knowledge is key. Some people spend far too much time on video games, but plenty of others work hard so they can enjoy an hour or two of gaming a day. If I totally avoid leisure activities, I suffer mentally and emotionally. I need a certain amount of downtime to flourish, and if I don't get it, I find it is very difficult for me to be happy creating. At the same time, I also think the consumption of art, which can include leisure activities like reading, is fundamental to keeping the creative well filled. So, don't make the mistake of trying to schedule out all fun from your day in hopes you will be more productive. Chances are you won't make as much progress as you wish, and you will get burned out that much faster. Some people also have serious hobbies that occupy a central role in their lives. These can be something like playing Dungeons and Dragons or golfing. To me, a hobby is different than a purposeful activity because a hobby is done for personal enjoyment, whereas the creation of art is done for both intrinsic and extrinsic reasons related to completion and transmission of a product. Nevertheless, some people take their Warhammer or their Magic the Gathering or their golf game very seriously. My general caution regarding hobbies of this sort is that they tend to act as a proxy for life output and thus make you feel like you are being productive when you are really just engaging in leisure. It feels good to get Gladiator or Grand Marshal in World of Warcraft, but did the same time spent reaching that pinnacle truly net you anything real and lasting? I could honestly say the same about your golf game, but we are trained to think of things like golf as being fundamentally different than video games, when the two activities, if judged by outputs, aren't much different. In my opinion and experience, hobbies are something that should be put in significant check if you want to be making gains in your creative output. You can have one, but more than that is going to suck up your time, and possibly your paycheck in a big way. Choose wisely what you do in your downtime, because putting limitations on leisure is one of the most important things you can do to make sure your output is consistent. Make time for your games, the amount of time you need to relax and enjoy the activity, but only spend the time you have budgeted. Leisure is also one of the things that you have to let go of in a pinch, so be ready to let it go when a deadline looms. 6. Social time. We are social beings. We live in groups. Social time is important. Our social nature is also something that is exploited by social media to suck our time and attention away from other matters, and this is something you must be aware of. Depending on your stage of life and personal attitude, social time is something that can be either minimal or all-consuming. It's also an area of life that few people are honest about when it comes to acknowledging their preferences. Very few individuals actually fit the lone wolf archetype. Even fewer can spend 10 hours a day riding by themselves. Some people are by nature extremely social, preferring a large quantity of time spent on social interaction. In my experience, young people are more social than older people, and probably for good reason, since a well-established friendship or marriage from youth will provide support throughout life. I find that having a limited budget of social time, as we used to think of it, is not such a difficult thing now, but it once was, and potentially still could be for some people. When I was a music student, I wasted copious amounts of time socializing. It was very easy to do this as the music department at my university was full of tables, benches, foyers, and other gathering spaces. And these gathering spaces were all full of other artists. That was great for comradeship, and even building professional relationships relating to performance, but it was very bad for productivity. Once I figured out that too much social time was a time sink and spent some effort developing some self-discipline and setting a schedule, my productivity skyrocketed. I didn't really have it all figured out until I was more than two years into the program, 
And there is a marked difference between my work those first two years and the work I did my second two years. I became a truly prolific composer and performer during that period, and I also wrote my first attempt at a novel, which was awful, but more on that later. I gigged every week with the band, learned hours of solo repertoire, which I performed regularly, and composed hours and hours of music. It really was my social time holding me back, but I never abandoned social time. I just held it in check to meal times between closely scheduled classes and parties. Any chunk of time more than 10 minutes in duration I spent practicing or working on new music. It was great at the time, but I don't think I would have done as well these days. Social media has changed everything. Social media. Social media has drastically changed the way we approach social interaction. When I was young, we had to call each other on the phone or otherwise be physically present with one another to communicate. Even text messaging was new and mostly annoying when I was in college and the smartest phone was a flip phone. Now, calls are a rarity and social media substitutes for a great degree of social interaction. Sites like Facebook are designed to hijack the social reward centers of our brains and feed us small dopamine rushes throughout the day, turning interacting with the site into a habit, or in some cases, an addiction. It's possible to waste huge amounts of time on social media every day, and I think most people are largely unaware of it. If you took a day to legitimately track the time spent on social media, you might be shocked to see how much time you have wasted. I know Android devices can track screen time. Try looking up yours sometime. If you are jumping at the chance to reclaim a few hours a day for creative work, slow down. The thing is, a lot of that time is spread out into little bite-sized chunks time that would likely be lost in the flow of the day anyway. However, social media's omnipresence also means that it occupies headspace and is a constant distraction. While you are checking Facebook, you aren't thinking of your project. That's time lost. It can also affect your mindset. What if nobody liked your post? Why is everyone else successful besides you? CNN says the world is ending. Facebook's filtering mechanisms ensure that you see things which engage you. Most often fear-mongering news or hot takes, since fear and anger are the most immediate emotions. And the user base only posts positive highlights like fancy dinners and beach trips, leading you to believe that your life is worse by comparison. The problem is, the contemporary artist needs to be on social media. It's the best and cheapest method of attracting an audience and building professional relationships in your field. As a creative, you cannot pull the plug without significantly harming your business. So, what to do? Here's my suggestions. You can do all or some of these. One, set a time for actual social media interaction. Do not exceed the allotted time. I usually answer YouTube comments only at one or two times per day for a limited number of minutes. This ensures that I still interact with my channel and that I also focus only on responding to comments that are really worth responding to. Good times for social media time would be when waking up and after getting home, or when using the bathroom. Two, if you feel bored, read instead of looking at social media. Ebooks are very cheap and blogs are free. You could be learning or reading a great story instead of flipping through photos of people you don't talk to anymore. Three, turn off all notifications on your phone. This will ensure that you are not distracted and if you are going to look at social media, it is because you at least have some time for it. Four, develop a specific social media strategy for your business. This will focus your interaction toward customers and other professionals. Are you posting about music? Are you talking about books? Are you passing out hot takes to get attention and using the follow-up to promote yourself? Five, spend time with real people. For me, a great part of my social time each day is virtual, and this is how it has to be. My social time with real people is limited because of my intense schedule, but I do my best to at least have lunch with a friend every once in a while. I almost never look at Facebook now. I'm on Twitter all the time. I'm on YouTube the most, and that is where most of my audience is. You have to find where you are going to get the best exposure for your art and your personality type. 7. Maintenance What I classify as maintenance are all the little obligations you have as part of living, cleaning the house, taking out the trash, fixing faucets, fixing cars, mowing the lawn, etc. I also include feeding yourself and performing basic hygiene. 
This is one area where I see an intense amount of focus directed toward things like life hacks. Little things that either save time or improve your effectiveness at life maintenance in the long run. I saw an ad for a device called the Y toothbrush that claimed it could clean your teeth in 10 seconds. I just watched a two minute video on it, which is how much time I could have just spent brushing my teeth. But it's tempting to consider it, since over the course of a year I would save 24 hours of time. Wow! The thing is, I think most of these things are of only marginal usefulness as far as saving time goes. 24 hours sounds like a lot, but when it is in two minute intervals, you could easily lose all of that time looking at Twitter and not gain anything for your investment. Meal prepping is a great example of this focus on making the mundane efficient. Lots of people swear by it. You spend part of Sunday prepping all of your meals for the coming week, then you just pop them in the oven or microwave during the weekday rush. You aren't saving time. You are shifting time from a day where you feel busy to one where you don't feel busy. This can be a big gain if you use the time saved each day productively. That's not what I do though. I eat roughly the same three meals a day, every day. No headspace taken up thinking about food. It's easy to manage the diet and macros and all of the meals I can make in five minutes anyway. Diet variety is something I don't care about. I don't care about meals very much because I really care about the other things I want to do, like riding and playing with my children. I put maintenance in the margins rather than my creativity. Paper plates, plastic spoons, and styrofoam cups. Let me share an anecdote with you. Some of you will hate me for this, but that's okay if you get the lesson. When I lived in Las Vegas, my roommate Matt, who would eventually become my brother-in-law, and I had a problem. We hated doing dishes, and we also kept plucking up the dishwasher with whey protein and dried milk. We were both big into fitness at the time. It was getting annoying, and we came up with a solution. We spent the next two years eating on nothing but paper plates and drinking from nothing besides styrofoam cups or soda cans. We cooked almost all of our meals on a $20 George Foreman electric grill. We ate the same few meals every day. We figured out we could buy the plates, cups, and spoons, which we used exclusively for protein shakes, cheaply from Costco. We bought styrofoam because it was cheaper than paper. We no longer had to spend any time on dishes, which was something we hated doing anyway. We no longer had to buy soap for the dishes, and there was no conflict whatsoever in managing domestic maintenance as a result, as the kitchen was 50% of the shared space, with the other half being the washer and dryer. It cost us about 15 extra dollars a month, split two ways. We could take a drink to the gym or anywhere else and just toss it. We had to empty the trash more often, which was not a big deal compared to the alternative, doing dishes. This was legitimately the only life hack that ever worked for me. And it was one that just happened to fit my situation. Maintenance as a priority. Where you put your household maintenance is largely a part of what you need as a person. If you need to have a very cleanly house, you have to find ways to do that as efficiently and effectively as possible. For me, a perfect house is not a need. Dusty shelves don't bug me except every so often. Same with dirty mirrors. Eventually they do bother me, but cleaning the mirrors once every other month is less time and effort than cleaning them every week. That's just reality. Whatever your needs, you do have to accept the fact that having a perfect house will take time and headspace away from other activities. What will you give up if this is something you must have? Personal maintenance. I think if there is one sub area where you should not try to cut corners, it is personal hygiene and beauty. This is especially the case if you are a woman. Speaking completely honestly, women are judged much more harshly for their looks than men are, and this includes judgment by other women. For a woman, skipping makeup is not an option, and personal dress is both more complicated and more important. You want to look your best if you are a performer or anyone who shows his or her face on social media. Looks matter. As an artist, you are marketing yourself, not just your art. Having your beard trimmed or face shaved will make you look better, and people will like you better for it. Having your hair neatly arranged and wearing clothes that fit properly will make people pay better attention to you. I've learned this through experience. Last year I hacked my beard down and suddenly everyone thought I had lost a bunch of weight. It was an immediate aesthetic upgrade, and people noticed. In fact, comments on my appearance, particularly my hair, are very common on my YouTube channel. People notice your appearance. Working in the margins. Let's take a look at that schedule from before. 6.30 a.m., 
wake up, get coffee, etc. 7.30 a.m., leave for work. 8 a.m., arrive at work. 5 p.m., leave work. 5.30 p.m., gym time. 6.30 p.m., head home. 7 p.m., arrive home, have dinner. 8 p.m., watch TV. 9 p.m., get the kids to bed. 10 p.m., go to bed. I think this is the way most people think of scheduling. I had a very similar schedule, in fact, when I was a high school teacher. It's actually not as tight a schedule as it looks, because things are missing from it. Let me tell you how my schedule actually panned out. 6.30 a.m., wake up. 7 a.m., out the door, get coffee slash rockstar on the way to work. 7.15 to 7.55, I record a podcast with my brother-in-law, also an author and musician, on our commute to work. 8 a.m., begin work. 9.45 9.45 a.m., union-mandated 15-minute break, master audio recording and upload the podcast, check social media. 11.40 a.m., union-mandated 45-minute lunch begins. Eat for 5 minutes while prepping to write. Write for 40 minutes. 12.25 p.m., union-negotiated prep period. I perform whatever work-related tasks are appropriate, then write the rest of the hour. 3 p.m., school ends. According to my union negotiations, I have to stay in my room another hour. I write. 4 p.m. If I have no performances at night, head home. Relax, listen to music, and talk shop with my brother-in-law on the way. 5 p.m. Gym time. 6 p.m. Get home. Dinner time slash family time. 8 p.m. Additional work time, as much as I need to get done that day. 9 p.m. Read to my son. He goes to sleep. 10 p.m. Onward. More work time or sleep. Looking back, this was a very loose and easy schedule for me to keep, and I got to work a lot. In fact, I got to work much more than I do now. Having only one child helped, as did the fact that my wife stayed home and did most of the home maintenance while I was away. You might notice that I cut time in some places. I showered after the gym, not in the morning. I had a longer commute than most, and I turned it into productive time to market my books. I viewed lunch as free time to work, not relax or socialize instead getting my relaxing and socializing done on my commute home. I viewed eight hours of sleep as optional, and I often took the option to stay up and finish important tasks. I got a lot of work done during the margins, the little spaces between other things that go wasted by most people. However, I always still had time specifically set aside for working on my creative goals. At the very bare minimum, you must schedule time to work, or you will find it simply is not there.